So, um, again, this subject that we're going to handle now, leading together as husband and wife, we need to live out a biblical kingdom example of life. That testimony is irrefutable when they see the fruit that come out of, comes out of a marriage and a home. And so when it comes to ministry, not only are you trying to work out your marital differences, but you're trying to find out how do we operate without it being patriarchal or, you know, just, you know, some kind of pseudo understanding of it. No, we genuinely want to do this together because God calls us as a couple. I know we pray for on eldership the man and he carries that mantle, but try and lead without your wife. You're going to be a miserable person. And, and, and the reason why we have become one is because there's a wonderful complementing of gifting and insight and the rest. It's the most perilous road to walk down is to kind of cross some of those bridges and work it out and, uh, because there's differences and, and the rest. And like I said, sometimes it's easier just to remain in your neutral corner and not tease that tiger. You know, you don't want to go down that road. Or we've got to be bold enough and realize that we owe it to the church when we lead properly as a couple. So I want to read Ephesians 5.22. It's a long portion of Scripture, but I think it will ground us nicely in what we need to handle. Wives, submit to your own husbands as to the Lord. Which of you, early on in your marriages, when you had a fight, you read that to your wife? <laughs> I did. And so the fight continued until we uh, worked that one out. <laughs> For the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church, his body and is himself its savior. Now, as the church submits to Christ, so also should wives submit in everything to their husbands. You see, we have misunderstood the role of love, that self-sacrificial, incredible love that God has for the church. So that's what we need to love our wives with. Husbands, love your wives that way. That he might sanctify, having cleansed her by the washing of water with the word, so that he might present the church to himself in splendor, without spot or wrinkle or any such thing, that she might be holy and without blemish. In the same way, husbands should love their wives as their own bodies. He who loves his wife loves himself, for no one ever hated his own flesh, but nourishes and cherishes it, just as Christ does the church, because we are members of his body. Therefore, a man shall leave his father and mother and hold fast to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. And this mystery is profound, and I'm saying that it refers to Christ and the church. However, let each one of you love his wife as himself, and let the wife see that she respects her husband. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for the truth of your word, and we know that if we were to get up in some public space or some context and read that passage of Scripture, it would attract so much criticism. But I thank you for the truth of your word, and that truth sets us free. And through truth, we're going to see so much more of your kingdom develop. I pray that we'd be examples of this truth, and, and that people see our lives, they'd be able to feed of the absolute joy and, and the kingdom fruit that would come about through it. We pray for that in the name of Jesus. Oh, we pray you'd help us to understand this and to put it into practice. Amen. So uh, the first thing is we need to settle that issue of complementarianism or egalitarianism. Uh, that is important, and I, I do believe it's a discussion you need to have with your wife. It's a discussion we need to have on our eldership teams uh, so that we can find a, a kind of kingdom value in this and we are able to articulate it. We are able to not just talk about sentiment or feeling, but we can refer to scriptures in that regard. So the brief summary, equal in value and identity, that's the thing. We have been created equal in every way. God has made us in, in that sense of value uh, not function, in value we're exactly the same and God loves us the same. So because I've got a different function to you and it may seem better in your eyes, th there isn't a value there. We put value on function, unfortunately. And so in that, we've got to learn to live with the approval of the Father. And I think 
you know, Grant said we, the, the extremism of um, complementarianism, you know, is where every man is the head of every woman. And, you know, the woman's only role is at home, pregnant, and supporting her husband. Initially, when we came into this local church, there was that opinion because we were Baptist in our roots. And that is seen as a kind of Baptist extreme opinion. But we're looking for a biblical complementarianism where very definitely created equally in value but different in function. And that's easy to show from the Scriptures because it applies to spiritual, physical, emotional, and all of it. It's, that's just the way it is. He's made us like that so that we can become one together. So complementary in function means male headship and female followership. But even in your leading, if you do not exercise that with your wife's understanding and input and wisdom, you're in trouble. Because I feel that left to itself is absolute disaster. It can become autocratic. It can become overbearing. Uh, it, it really can become something that is nasty. And here's the issue. In all of this, it's learning to lead together as a couple. And there is nothing worse than seeing a couple compete. You know, it's the wife's trying to get her bit in, and then the husband's using the pulpit to put his wife down or, you know, make snide remarks and and, you know, that kind of competing. And the atmosphere we live in, the, the spiritual atmosphere in churches, there's, you know, women are being ordained as elders. And some women are incredible, you know, in their gifting, the rest of it. And so we've got to come in with a, a clear understanding of how we can lead together. So here we have it. We equally in value, we complementary in function, and we are different in gifting, anointing, and personality. So that's why this thing is a mystery. How <laughs> you can put all of that together and find God's way. It is equal, complementary, and different. And I do feel God gives us whatever we need in His Word. And it's interesting, when you slip into it, you can feel the joy. Psalm 133, which talks about unity, unity in a marriage, there's great anointing, there's great pleasure. You can walk into the home and you can sense it. Sense it straight away. And you know some homes you can walk into and you can feel that World War III has just taken place. And it seems to be the status quo. I remember Bible College, I walked into the home of a couple who stayed across the road from where we went to this Bible College and uh, I was going to help them carry scones across for the evening meeting. I went to knock on the door and it just opened. And I kind of, as I walked in, the husband was still in his gown, red in his face, and he just marched to the bedroom, and he stared at me, and he said, don't ask. And I walked into the kitchen, and his wife was sitting on the floor crying, and there were scones all over the wall, and dripping down, and cream all over the place. I realized they weren't quite in unity at that particular moment in time. So I just very quietly did a U-turn, closed the door, and walked away. <laughs> the easiest thing to do. <laughs> So, male headship in, you know, the triangle, the point at the top, you know, uh, kind of the dictatorial model is, that is not complementarianism. Similarly, with the triangle pointing down, that is a manipulative model, uh, you know, which is extreme feminism, I suppose, as an example of that. Or where there's just nothing, egalitarianism is that straight line. That means nobody's taking the lead or, you know, if you want to lead or I lead, it doesn't matter. No, actually chaos will, will come about. But the triangle on its side, it's team leadership is what God has designed, is that we operate as a team. And in that is the greatest amount of joy. So we lead together. Uh, we recognize the biblical structures of authority, but together we explore what are your gifts. So now I know for us, I, I, there might be a big picture I see, but man, I tell you, Adele is incredible with foresight, with wisdom, and pastoring. I miss all the pastoring cues. And then I realize, as I'm listening to Adele, wow, I didn't realize that. Well, look, generally speaking, when we meet a couple who we haven't seen for a while, she asks, how's your sister's child? I'm just trying to get the name of this person. You know, and I'm hoping that Adele's going to say, so Mary, how's your sister's child? <laughs> so... But then Adele drops me sometimes. She says, so who are these people? 
And I think, I don't know. So we've found that God compliments us. Yes, as a husband and a wife, as, as leaders together with the different gifts we bring with that, but there's, there's a set of gifts in her that I want to see come about. I, I want to figure these out. And as I said, the growth in our ministry is the discovery of that and, and leaning on her for that because we are better for it. Uh, our marriage is better for it, the people we, we lead. Um, for me, this accelerated way forward and this unity that brings anointing is going to be that, that continual growth. And you might start at a point, and I was very stubborn initially because I felt because God had anointed me, uh, you know, I had the whole package deal. No, I, I had to kind of realize that my wife had a lot more than I thought. I remember in the initial stages of planting a church into inner city area in Johannesburg, my job was to plant and to do all of that. She raised the kids and that was it. You know, she didn't get involved with my area. I didn't get involved with her area. We needed rescue and we were rescued. Guard your marriage. In other words, make it fail safe. It's very important that. Uh, it's very important that you set up some systems. I do not counsel a woman alone. If there's a woman that needs counseling, I do it with Adele. If there's a guy that needs counseling and they approach her, we do it together. We, we don't do that. I don't go and sit in a coffee shop with a lady and try and give her marriage counseling or any counseling. I had a lady that uh, uh, wasn't serving God. Her husband was in our church. I prophesied something over him. He went and told his wife, she will be saved. Marcus has prophesied it. She came storming on the Monday into the church and there was nobody around. She wanted to see me. And I said, no, I can't see. I must phone my wife. Adele was busy with the kids. And she said, do you suppose you think I'm a sex maniac? I said, no, I'm just not going to see you alone. That's as simple as it is. So eventually I got one of the ladies that work in our kitchen to sit with me until Adele got there. But I wanted her to know that we don't do it that way. Downstairs with our offices, all of our offices have got windows in them for accountability. We just want to live above reproach. We want to do that. It's just very important that. And so in that, there must be an accountability as well. And so, like I said, under the anointing, when you're preaching, you seem like something. And so, you know, don't think you're that person. And so we, you know, Dell helps me to see these things. We want to make sure our marriages are safe. Be accountable to those that you have around you. If you have got issues when it comes to pornography or, you know, uh, like, you're battling in that area. We need to deal with it. We need to deal with it. I am going to ask Adele to come. She's going to share, and then I'll end off with one or two points. Thank you, Adele. At last. Right. While Marcus has told you all the manual stuff, I'm going to tell you the real stuff. Eh? No, no. Um, yeah. I don't think I've got a book to refer to, but the Bible, hey? So church planting, most of the times when women hear that, they scream. And that's what I did when Marcus first told me that we're going to go and plant a church in Hillbrow. So for someone that was saved at the age of 12 and maybe smoked one cigarette, just to prove that I could inhale uh, smoke, it was overwhelming. And I thought, no, no, how am I ever going to go to Hilbra? And yeah, so husbands, I want to encourage you to lead your wives gently. Don't just tell them and give them the scary parts of everything, hey? Um, yeah, so um, for me, it was very scary when um, that happened because I didn't know that community. So Marcus is... Um, Unsaved life was in that community while I was in church. And um, so those fears, you have to break them. But um, I feel if your husband knows how to lead you and doesn't push you and bully you, you'll be able to take up anything that God's got for you as a couple. Yeah. I think it brings security when your husband, that when you know the God that your husband can trust. And that's what I've learned. Do you know what? Marcus is not going to take me and our family into an area that um, is going to harm us. Because he's hearing from God. And because he's hearing from God, I can trust him. 
And that's the important thing that when we pray for our husbands, we trust that they're your God. It's not just their own good idea. <laughs> husbands, be consistent. Don't always bring, I mean, I know, we were planting in Hilbra, and then since then we were planting in Hong Kong, Singapore, New Zealand, wherever Marcus went and he came back, he had a vision. And then I used to fight that vision and one day God said, stop fighting, allow me to do it. So allow him to dream. So that's what I do now. If he tells me we're going anywhere, I say, that's wonderful. And I just keep on letting the dream happen because God will be the one that's going to fulfill it. Don't always fight the dreams that your husband has. So, women, we need to ask God for a man of faith. We all want a man of faith. Hey, I know Bonita wants her husband to be this man of faith. But we also be, need to be women of faith. As much as we want a, a man of faith, we need to have, um, we need women of faith. And do you know what? When our husbands go and plant and we are called together, they're going to need faith. <laughs> it's not easy. You're going to need a lot of faith. So keep on praying and trusting God that he'll become that man of faith and you be that woman of faith. So many times, I just want to say again, men, don't bully your wife. Lead her gently. If your wife is not where you are and you want to go and plant that church, don't pull her along because that's what Marcus did with me in the beginning. I was dragged along. You will do that. And you know how we read that thing about submitting? You want to be the perfect wife, but that's not the, what God wants us to do. So don't bully your wife. Lead her gently. Don't force her to do things that you think she needs to do. Because God has made each one of us different, and we're not all going to do everything that every other wife that you see on TV doing. Because it, it doesn't work like that. <laughs> So our story, I got saved at the age of 12. My mom was Lebanese and my dad was German. So I had a very strong upbringing. And yeah, I've got five sisters and we're all very strong women. So even in that, when I got saved at the age of 12, I wanted to serve God. I had a plan and I knew God had called me and he was going to fulfill that. So I always wanted to serve God. I always wanted to do things just for God. And um, then, of course, when Marcus got saved, I was already saved, so I'm much more mature, and <laughs> he got saved, and then Bible college came along, and then church planting, and um, that's what we wanted. Um, so often people ask us, how can you still be in ministry 40 years this year? We have to be crazy. There has to be something wrong with you. You're still in the ministry. Well, all I can say is that we love Jesus, we love his church, and we just get on with it. So 40 years seems forever. And I must say in those 40 years, maybe there were one or two years that I wanted to get out of the ministry. But that was not very often because I fell in love with Jesus and I loved the call of God and the privilege of being called by God. And that's what I never want to lose, is that a great privilege to be called and um, to serve God and to love his people. So that's what's kept us going for 40 years. Nothing great and great ministry. I can't look and say we've done great things, but we have. We've loved Jesus and we've loved his church and we've looked after his church. So... Um, yeah, so we headed out to Hilbra. Like I said, for me, wow, it was very scary. Very, very scary because of the area we were going in. Not for Marcus. He was so excited about doing this. And um, yeah, I fought it in the beginning. I really did. This is not what I want. I want to rather stay in Edenvale, Bedford View. I hated going into Hilbra. And I remember going in there and I wanted nobody to even touch Wendy because what a society that was. They were the unclean. It was like they had leprosy. So do you think the church was going to work with my heart being like that? Definitely not. So God had to change me, hey? And he did that. He was so faithful in, as I surrendered to, to him and said, Lord, if this is what you've got for our marriage, I, Marcus is not going to change his mind. He's heard God, I'm going to have to change. And that's when I heard, when I totally surrendered to the Lord, I heard his voice. I didn't rely on Marcus's 
um, voice, I had to hear the Father's voice saying, Adele, that's what I've got for you as well. You are called together um, as a couple. And that's when I really changed my heart. I realized that those people weren't as evil as I thought they were. They were just normal people that had had a difficult um, time in their life. They weren't going to kill my child. They weren't going to um, kidnap her. They weren't going to do all those harm things that I had in my mind. And I surrendered to the Lord and I realized, Lord, I cannot fight this anymore. Because if I carry on fighting the call, our marriage would not survive. No marriage can fight, survive if your husband's going one way and you're going another way and you're fighting it all the time. So, um, yeah, so our Hilbra experience started off terrible. Eventually, I was driving into Hilbra with my two little kids, and I wasn't so scared. I could um, park outside high points and not think everyone's going to attack me, and that was a supernatural thing that I experienced from the Lord. He gave me that, and I so wanted to just serve the Lord and do it. But you know what? The church that we were with, the organization, they said to us, good luck. Off you go. Let's see if it's going to work. And how many times did we hear this week saying that we need the team? Guys, you cannot do it alone. Husbands, you cannot do it alone. You cannot just do it alone. So we were sent out there. And that was it. Well, good luck. Let's hope that you're going to make it. And in that time was when we met um, New Covenant Ministries. And that was our rescue as well. And we got to know the guys. We started meeting and fellowshipping with them. And wow, the things I heard, that woman was important, that God's got a call on couples' lives. I'd never heard that before. And God is in church planting, and he wants to bless churches. And that was the, the saving grace. It was God's grace rescuing us. And sure. And then after a while, the Hillbrow Church season came to an end. And do you know what it was all about? It was my heart being changed. God changed me, and he said, now I've got more things for you. You be faithful with what I've called you to do, and I can add more to you. And that's what happened. We came, we closed the church down. Um, it was according to what God had for us, the next season that God um, had for us, and we came to a Cornerstone. And that was amazing, because we came into Cornerstone, Marcus had to go back to work, I went back to work, and wow, we had to just re-establish finance in our lives, because you know in Hilbra, you don't get types, you give the people, um, it was just that um, society, you know, and, and yeah, so we got back into working again, buying a house, getting a lovely company car, and I thought, well, this is lovely. It only lasts for a few months. Once God has called you, nothing, absolutely nothing can satisfy the call of God. You can enjoy it for a moment, but wow. And we sat and we were rescued again. We heard Leon and Pat speak and they taught us things. We heard about marriage and it was lovely. But that call was in our hearts and we so wanted it. There was nothing going to stop us. And by the end of that year, Leon asked us to come on eldership, and he said to us, please go and pray about it. We said, no, we don't have to pray. We already know this is what we want. So once you called, and that's why we're still in the ministry for 40 years, because we know we are called by God, and we are still going to carry on being called by God until he decides what he's going to do with us. So we were invited onto that eldership at Cornerstone. And we were on two eldership teams, and that is amazing. When you are married to a church planter and a lead elder, for him to be on two eldership teams is very difficult. <laughs> but Marcus, I must say well done to him because he submitted to Leon and Pat being on that eldership team team, we learned so much. God set us up for to learn so much. Then when they left to go to Australia, we had the privilege again. After many words being given to us, you should go and plant, you should do this, you, you should do that. But you know what? We never heard God saying that. And we knew when we are there, those prophecies that have come are just going to confirm what God is saying to us. But if God hasn't spoken, 
don't go and do something that he hasn't called you to do. And then for the next seven years, we were on Jim and Margaret's eldership team. And this time we even served more with Barry and Heather sitting here. And it was a great privilege. We learned, we loved the church, and that was amazing. And then God revealed the next season for us, and that's when we started to lead um, Cornerstone. So we have had two couples that have shown us And they can honestly say, follow me as I follow Christ. We have seen that in Jim and Margaret. We've seen that in Leon and Pat. We could look at them and say, yo, it can work for them. That's the marriage we want. That's the way we want to bring up our children. That's the way we want to love the church. So we have had a very good experience of people that have gone before us and have made the way for us. And we walk in in that today. So um, just to honor them and say thank you for um, opening those doors for us and that we could walk in them. So was ministry always easy when we planted the church? No, it wasn't. Like Marcus said, he was determined to get there and I was determined to be at home with my two little kids. And, but you know, when God changes your heart, there's nothing more um, exciting about that. And the Bible, ministry is all in the Bible. The Bible is so full of people that have done it. We weren't the first people. It's from the Bible days. We all know about Abram and Sarah. And we've learned that this week. You've heard from so many about their different callings. But what I learned is that I needed to prepare and give up and all the privileges that I had. I can't come and say, Lord, if you give me this, I will go and plant the church. If you still give me the way I'm living in my big mansion in Bedford View, and I'm definitely not going to Hillborough, but if you give me that mansion and don't, you give up. Sarah had to give up so much for what God had for them. You will sacrifice the the privileges because you so want to serve God. It is amazing. Once God gets hold of your heart, those things aren't important. If you keep your eyes on Jesus, if you seek first his kingdom, He will give you exactly what you need. There were things I had to give up. Some people, yeah, are going to plant a church. They have to sacrifice their families. I've never had to do that when I was growing up, but now my children have all gone to the nations. I don't know why they've listened, but um, that's what we do. We give up things for the call of God. All right, Sarah had to leave a privileged home. She followed Abraham. She must have been an amazing woman. She didn't have children, but I can imagine her being that lovely auntie. Do you know when you've got a sister that just can't have children and you've got children? She spoils your children so much. And that's how I could have seen Sarah, looking after all the other people's children until God gave her hers. All right, she left her tent. She went to live in a different place. And once when we were doing church planting, I think it was a few years ago, Matt from Abu Dhabi, he spoke, and he said that God had told them to go from Dubai to Abu Dhabi, and he went ahead to prepare the home for, his wife's name is Rana, and I thought, gee, isn't that wonderful? God said to him, go and prepare your, that home in Abu Dhabi, that when Rana comes, it will be all ready, and I thought, in that, she needed that. God already knows what we all need, so husbands, listen to what God's saying. He wants to bless your family. He wants you to lead in this. He wants you to lead your wife. Not push her, but to lead her. Sarah, I can't see it in the Bible. She didn't have a word from God. Did I have a word from God when he said, going to Hebra? No, I was just listening to what he was saying to Marcus and having peace. I couldn't say, thus said the Lord, you will go. If you are waiting for all of that, you might never go. Sometimes he just, sorry, gives us peace. And if we know that our husbands, your God, we'll be able to follow them very easy because we trust in the same God. Hmm. So if you, your wife is only following you because you are forcing her men and she hasn't got it in her heart, I would say to you today, slow down a little bit. Don't pull her along. Don't push her. Um, let her catch up to you. Um, Because if wives go out there and they don't want it, they are going to cause 
havoc. Women, we can derail our husbands very easily. We can make things happen that by manipulating. So I would rather st say, stay in your church until you've got your wife on board. Not 100%, because I don't think women are ever 100%. There are a few that are ahead of their husbands, but not many that I know of. So husbands, lead your wife properly. Just take time to explain the call. And then ladies, allow your husband to dream. I know, I was trying to tell Marcus, most of his dreams were my nightmares. So now how do I do this? Until God said, no, no, let him dream. I will fulfill what I've got on his life. Bible tells us of people that aren't perfect. Sarah wasn't perfect. She gave up hope. So you're going to plant a church. You're going to be pushed to every extent, especially financially. And she gave up hope. We will give up hope. But we just keep the call of God in front of us. So like I said, my life planting in Hilborough, um, did I have a word? No. Was it easy? No. It was very hard. But God was with me. And I needed scriptures and things that I could hold on and say, God, you have made me into this call. And then sometimes uh, we just go ahead of our husbands. Like Sarah, she couldn't wait for the fulfillment. Sometimes we just can't wait for God to bring the people into the church. We get impatient. When is he doing this? When is he going to provide for us? When are we going to do this, 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 and that? You know what? Sometimes our voices, women, are like a nagging tap in our husband's ears. And I must say that sometimes Marcus has listened to me the same way as Abraham listened to Sarah, Marcus listened to me, and it derailed us because my voice was so loud. And he'd rather <laughs> face God than face me. Do you know how it is sometimes? Because we nag. Don't derail your husband. Don't nag and force them to do things that you feel. And um, break the things that God has got for us. Don't do that. So take we're going to have to take responsibility for decisions we make. So if we force our husbands to do what we want, he's going to have to pay the consequences of it. And so will us, and the wives and their children. So don't be naggers. Don't lose faith. If God has called you to go and plant a church, and you're a little bit impatient, and you're saying to your husband, you know what, sell the house everything, get into debt, let's go. No, no, don't do that. Men, don't listen to your wife. Don't listen to your wives if it's not what God is saying to you. Be bold enough to say no and lead your family well. Wives, never be driven by emotions. Okay, get our emotions under control. So yeah, there's so many things I can say. Trust your husband, trust your husband. Trust his decision even when you sometimes disagree with him. Now, I often disagree with Marcus, <laughs> but I've learned how to, even if I disagree, in the end, God's going to um, have his way. But I don't say, well, I'm disagreeing with you, and you go and make the mistakes. No, no, we don't manipulate. Sometimes we just can't agree, but we take it to the Lord. Remind ourselves, ladies, that the husband is the head. And I know we don't like that, but he is. He's going to give an account for his family to God. So ladies, I want to encourage you. As much as we want our men to be full of faith and they must do everything, we need to be women of faith. And then I just want to mention, how do we take our children with us? Because that's another question. How did you do this with your children? Even now, ladies will say, how do I bring my children to the prayer meeting? How are you going to plant a church if you're wondering how can you bring your children to the prayer meeting in this safe environment? You just encourage them. You prepare them for the prayer meeting and you take them with. I believe that you... Um, we take our whole family with us. So we teach our children what we are doing. We talk to them. This is our call. You guys are called with us. God has a plan and a purpose for you. He has chosen us to be your parents. So we are going to take you with us. We take our children and we look after them. We um, encourage them. I always feel that a woman that's wondering, should I be at the elders' meeting? Should I be at prayer meeting? Should I be here? Should I be there? 
that's not the problem, it's the heart issue. Because if your heart is steadfast and it's with what God's got, you will do exactly what God wants you to do. And you will make a plan. And there'll be times when you can't be at everything, but most of the time when your heart is where it should be, it's you want to be in God's presence with your children. Okay, keep your children consistent. We must keep our children. Not one day we plant in a church, then the next week we're somewhere else. Then we go to prayer meeting, then we're not going to prayer meeting, then we go here, yeah, we go to church on Sunday, no, we're not going. There must be consistency in your family. They are not the king and queen of your house. Okay, mom and dad, you are in charge of your family. Okay, so if children say we're not going to prayer meeting, no, no, that's they don't rule the home. Mom and dad lead, okay. But there's still, we need to give our children time and lead them and guide them and help them. So we've only, our children only know ministry. From the day I got married, I only know ministry with working, but we only know ministry. We only know church. Um, let them know they are important. Not the king of the castle, but they are important. Marcus would all, uh, often, if he went away and he got something, when he'd come back, we, he would share the privilege with the children as well. The blessing as well as the sacrifice. Let them know that God has got a call for them. It's so wonderful to see um, when we went to Pretoria and all of you were ordained and your children were all in the worship team. All of them. And I've still got that picture. And I look at it. Lord, this is what we want. The next generation to come through. And they're part of church planting. Dads, take time. Um, to spend time alone with your children. They are not the kin of the castles. They don't rule, but they are your first sheep after your wife. God is going to hold you accountable for your wife and your children. As small as they are, they need you. They need mom and dad in their lives. One thing that I had to learn, don't let your children hate the church. Now, the only way they're not going to hate the church is up to you. And I had a terrible experience once. It was, I was nearly burnt out. All my own causes. You know when you have enough of everyone and you don't want to see people? So it was a Wednesday night and Marcus was going out. And I thought, now this is a great night. We're going to close the blinds, lock the door, lock the gate. So if anybody comes, because people would often pop in. And so then they know we're not at home. And Wendy, Craig... We're going to just have a nice um, family evening. We got all ready to watch the movie, and then the bell rang at the gates. And I could not believe what I asked my children to do. I said, hide. Get on the floor. Don't let them see that we're home, because they could see through the blinds. I said, just flat on the floor, and soon they'll go away. And there the three of us were lying on the floor. Wendy's big brown eyes and Craig stunned that his mom now was telling him to hide. I was telling him to hide from the people of the church because they were stealing our time and they must know that we have family time tonight. And as I was lying there, I felt the Lord just give me one smack and say, Adele, what are you teaching your children? That these people, these people in the church are taking up all your time. Well, I got up, they got up, the doorbell was still ringing, and I got out, and outside the gate was a lady with a big basket of treats for us. And gee, I had to humbly go before the Lord and say, Lord, let me never get to that place. And I had to repent in front of my kids. And then I learned that if I'm tired of people, all I must do is take some time out, not tell my children how bad these people are and this terrible church and they take dad away every night and they're terrible because they will begin to hate the church. And I had to repent and start learning that I need to take time out. And God taught me a whole lot of lessons of how to teach our children to love the church and to be there for our children. Read the moments with your family. Sometimes you need to be at home with your children. Sometimes they write in exams. They need to have time with you. And so we have learned this journey. We haven't, we've made lots of mistakes, but I definitely can say that there's nothing that we'd rather be doing. 
then encouraging you guys that you can do it, your families can do it, you might not have the, everything in order. Ladies, you lack all the details. God's not going to give you all the details because he's going to write your story and you're in the process. So it's going to be your story and he's going to use your family and he's going to use you to reach a certain amount of people. So love your family. Love Jesus. Let them see you loving Jesus. Let them see that you love the church and that there's a privilege of serving God in the ministry. And yeah, so you can all do it. We should have a whole five days just talking about how to love the church, how to love people, how to um, see what God has got for us and our families. So that's our journey. So I can just say, be happy, (laughs) even when it gets difficult. You know, so many times I've said, I'm out of this. Never want to speak to a person again. I'm not going to trust anybody. How many times can they hurt us? And you know what? It takes a day or two, and then you're back there, and the next person is telling you how much they love you and how much they care. And if you don't deal with your heart, you'll always say, I wonder if I can trust you. Of course we can, because God is in it. And we have to learn to rise beyond what we are feeling, and God gives us the strength, because we are leaders, and God has called us, and we are able to do those things. So there have been times when I think I'm never doing this again. It hasn't lasted more than a few days, because I love God's call, and I love God's people. Okay, Marcus. So, let's stand, please. I think it'll be great. We want to pray for Us as couples, um, just one thing I was reminded of that we can neglect very quickly is we need to keep love alive. Uh, You know, I think very soon we can just tolerate each other and take things for granted. But uh, guys, be creative with that. You know, most of the times it was Adele arranging nights out or holidays or special things. And I had to be challenged with that. I remember going to some of the initial meetings with Dudley and he would say, it's Friday today, and now you're going home, on the way home, pick up some flowers or chocolates and make sure it's not an apology, but it's actually a way to keep love alive. And the first time I went to go and buy flowers, I bought her carnations. Mm. She, oh, she thought she was going to a funeral. <laughs> it took me about three years to realize she likes white roses and uh, so on and so on. So we need to keep love alive. Look for wonderful you know, ways to keep the communication going. Communicate, even over-communicate if necessary. Wonderful privilege. So, Father, we thank you right now in the name of Jesus for every couple. And we do believe that this celebrated way of life, of leading together, taking our children on the journey with us, uh, is worth it. it. There's a lot of hard work, but by the power of your Spirit, you enable us. And we pray that in the process, Father, Uh, wives would never see themselves as some kind of addition, you know, to make the husband look good or just pick up after him or whatever it is, Lord, but that genuinely we'd work together and help us as the men to be able to lead creatively, Lord, to be able to, um, like we are with the rest of the body of Christ, help them find their place so that they can see all the joy of serving you as well. And so we pray that kind of freedom over every marriage that is here. We do that in the name of Jesus. Thank you. And Lord, I just pray for the wives, even if your wife's not here today, just lift up your hand because you represent her. We pray for the wives that aren't here today, Lord, that they'll know that they are part of this, Father. Even though they haven't heard the messages this week, Lord, somehow, Lord, their husbands will be able to bring them up to speed. Lord, I just pray for them, Father. And I just felt, wives, some of you just think that you're just there to make your husband look good. So if I'm looking good on a Sunday, all pretty, nice, it's just what I'm called to. And God is saying today, you're not just called to that. He's given you maybe outer beauty, inner beauty, but he's given you so much that he wants you to use for his body. So I just feel that we need to break that off you. If you're feeling that way, just lift up your hand and say, Lord, 
Help me see that you have called me. Father, I pray for the ladies. I just pray, Lord, that they'll know that they are called as much as their husbands. They've got a part, Lord, in your kingdom to build your kingdom. They've got a part, Lord, to love your people. They've got a part in building your church, Father. I just pray that they'll not just see themselves as just there to stand and look good. No, Father, but they'll step out with everything that you have got for them, Lord. If it's a word of encouragement, if whatever it is, Lord, you've given each one of us different callings. And I pray, Lord, that we'll step in to the calling that you've given us. I pray and I break pictures from these ladies' minds, Lord, that they've seen maybe that our um, a wife should be, Lord. And they're not even looking into your word, Lord, but they're looking at um, people around them. I just pray that they'll see you the way you see them, Father, and they'll just step into that. Such freedom when you just do what God's called you to do and be where you are and break those pictures that you think of what you should be because God has created you to be where you are. And Father, I pray for each couple now that Lord will see us getting stronger and stronger, that the world can see a different picture, Lord, of man and woman standing together, supporting each other, Lord, serving together, Father. I just pray, Lord, that we'll find such joy serving together, such joy leading together. I pray for that, Lord, that you'll fill us with your joy, Lord, that we'll see this great privilege, Lord. And Father, for the couples that are wondering where they're going to plant, Lord, and there's a little bit of tension and pressure, I just pray, Lord, that they'll just lay it all down and they'll just connect with each other again and start praying together, Father, and finding out what God has got for them as a couple. Thank you, Jesus. We thank you for the privilege of the call on our lives, Lord. Thank you, Father. We pray for our children. I even feel we need to pray for our children today. So, Lord, we bring all our children before you, Father. You see them. They're little. Some are even not even born yet. Some are going through teenage years, Lord. And I pray for them. And I pray that they'll, you'll even set us free from all this anxiety. What's going to happen to my children? No, Lord, I pray that we'll know that you have called our children to be part of this team. And Lord, that you will even give them dreams and visions that they'll be, and scriptures, Lord, that they'll encourage the parents with it, Lord. That you'll prepare their hearts for what you have got for these couples, Lord. Thank you that none of our children will be lost, Father, but they'll go further than us, Lord. We pray for that in Jesus' name. Amen.